Okay, my name is, uh, is Jerry Spitzer. Let me sh um, now, I know my name without this, but it reminds me that I need to shut off the phone. And it reminds me that you need to do the same thing, please. So my name is Jerry Spitzer, and I serve on the JDC's Archives Committee. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the first of two public lectures sponsored by the JDC Archives this year. And it's in the context of the Fred and Ellen Lewis JDC Archives Fellowship Program. We're delighted with this tremendous response. We had uh, close to 200 people, and this was only decided um, in a short period of time. The JDC Archives houses the records of JDC since its creation 100 years ago. And it's one of the most important repositories in the world for modern Jewish history. Visiting scholars around the world utilize our unique offerings. They do their research. Publishers who are doing books come to do research at JDC, journalists, family researchers, curators, um, filmmakers. And I invite all of you to visit this wonderful website that we have, and you'll see online exhibits, pursue photo collections, trace family members um, with names that we have in our archives, and even our pictures, uh, our photos. It's probably the largest collection, probably any place in the world is, is over 100,000 photos going back to our founding in 1914. So I'd like to recognize and thank the American Sephardi Federation, the co-sponsor of this program today, and to thank Lynn Winters from the ASF. Um, I want to thank you, Lynn, and I'd like to call upon you to say a few words of welcome to our guests, please. I'll stay back. Thank you. Okay. So good evening. Uh, I am Lynn Winters, the director of the American Sephardi Federation, and we're really proud to be presenting tonight's lecture with the JDC. This is, uh, I think, the second time we've worked together. Uh, the JDC archives, with records of activity in over 90 countries, dating from 1914 to the present, is an extraordinary and unique treasure in the archival world. And tonight, we welcome you here at our home at the Center for Jewish History and invite you back many times. ASF's mission is to serve as the center for the preservation of the history, traditions, and rich cultural heritage of Sephardi and Mizrahi communities as an integral part of Jewish experience. In addition to our programs, exhibitions, and our annual New York Sephardic Jewish Film Festival, which I hope Many of you have attended and will attend in uh, March of 2014. Uh, ASF Sephardic Library and Archives is part of the center's Lillian Goldman Reading Room, which along with the holdings of the other center partners consists of more than 500,000 volumes in multiple languages from many time periods, as well as over 100 million documents, personal papers, photographs, multimedia recordings, posters, art, and artifacts. And the library here in this building is open to the general public. So I would like to recognize um, ASF's chairman, Mr. Mike Nassimi, who's here tonight and is himself a member of the Iranian community. And lastly, my thanks to the JDC and especially to Linda Levy for reaching out to us and for her patience in planning tonight's program. Thank you very much. So to get started, I've um, had the honor uh, as serving as chairman for the Fred and Ellen Lewis JDC Archives Advisory Committee. I'd like to tell you a little about the fellowship and about Ellen Lewis. Ellen Lewis uh, was a longtime JDC employee who was a German refugee, was helped by the JDC in Shanghai. Um, she actually began to work for JDC in Shanghai, and at the end of the war, was liberated to the United States and continued to work at the JDC. Um, I had the, uh, 
the honor and the privilege of, of actually working with her from 1978 till the time she left the joint. Um, she left a significant bequest to the JDC, uh, particularly for archives. And a number of us got together and we said the best way to remember her, to honor her, and um, to do what I think she would have liked was to form this uh, group and provide fellowships to those aspiring writers, um, graduate students, people who um, would benefit, mostly academics, who would benefit from the use of the archives uh, for their research and for a small stipend to help them through these difficult years. So today, our speaker is Lior Sternfeld, who is one of the fellows who was awarded a fellowship 2013. Uh, Mr. Sternfeld will be addressing us today on the topic, the Jewish community in Iran, 1941 until the revolution, which was the end of 78. Uh, now, index cards were distributed to you when you came in. Um, if, so if you have any questions at the end, uh, we're gonna take them from the cards rather than from raising hands, but you will have opportunity to ask questions. Um, a little about Lior. Our speaker, Lior Sternfeld, is a doctoral student. You see it here at the University of Texas at Austin. He was born and raised in Israel and received his bachelor's degree in Middle Eastern studies and Jewish history, and a master's degree in Middle East studies from Ben Gurion University in the Negev. Mr. Sternfeld wrote his thesis between Abdan and Suez, the emergence of Mo Mosagedism under the supervision of Reli Schechter and Hagi Ram. In this thesis, he examines how the policy of the prime minister at that time in the 1950s impacted and changed really history in that part of the world, first in Egypt and then it changed history in, in Iran. So during his studies at Ben Gurion University, he also served on the editorial board and it was a coordinator for JAMA's Journal of Middle East Studies. In the fall of 2009, Mr. Sternfeld entered the doctoral program at the University of Texas at Austin in the history department working under Dr. Kaman uh, Agai. His research focused on Iranian minorities in the era of the Shah. Now, when we had people applying for fellowships, we had a lot of people around the country. Very difficult, we only could choose two. It was very difficult. And what were we looking at? The significance of the research. Could we help by the materials that we had? Um, and recommendations, et cetera. So of the many, many that applied, we were very happy in, in, to award um, one of the fellowships tonight, so don't, don't disappoint us. Um, <laughs> anyways, now you're gonna enjoy it. I've, I've listened to him before. It's a fascinating topic. He spent years and years on this, and after his, his uh, uh, talk, which will be about 35 to 45 minutes, there will be time for questions. Again, only from the index cards that were made out. We're not gonna take you know, hands up at the time. Okay, so let me introduce our speaker. Thank you, walking so slow, come on. All right. Hi, thank you. Salam, the conference, Eman, Khosh uh, first, I would like to thank Jerry, Linda, Naomi, Shelley, and of course the super archivist Misha. I would like to thank the fellowship committee for awarding me this generous prize and the opportunity to work in the JDC archives. And I would like to thank the JDC people for the warm welcoming. So, as you can hear from my accent, I'm from Texas. So, no, I'm from Israel, and 
for the past 10 years, I've been studying Iran, Iranian history, and the Iranian Jewish community. And I hope today to tell you a story that is more complicated and more nuanced than what we usually tend to think about Iran and the Iranian Jewish minority. So if I were to ask you, what is the biggest Jewish community in the Middle East outside Israel? I don't think that many of the people would say Iran. But Iran has the, the biggest Jewish community in, in the Middle East today, ranging from 25 to 35,000 people. Another thing that we don't tend to think about is of Iran as a shelter, as a country that was a safe haven from, for uh, many, many refugees during uh, many periods of time. Our story begins, the background for our story begins in 1906 with the Constitutional Revolution of Iran. It's, it was the first time that the Iranian subjects became um, citizens. Citizen was not a term in the Iranian vocabulary or any, as a matter of fact, and the Constitutional Revolution granted them equal rights. It took, it, they drafted a constitution according to the Belgian model, which in many senses fitted the social tapestry of Iran at that time. And the Iranian Jewish community got representation in the parliament for the first time after the revolution. Ironically, the first representatives of the, of the Jewish community were Muslim ayatollahs. <laughs> the first one was Ayatollah uh, Tabtebai, and the second was Ayatollah Behbani. Another thing that we have to know about the Jewish community of Iran is that it's actually not a Jewish community, but rather Jewish communities. The Jewish communities of Iran are many, and they are comprised from many city communities, ethnic communities, uh, as we will see uh, in the next 30 something minutes. The majority of them were Persian Jews. Some of them were Kurdish Jews. We had a significant community of Iraqi Jews, after, especially after the 1941, and another community that joined Iranian, uh, the Iranian society after 1941 was a group, smaller group of Ashkenazi Jews. So in the beginning of the period that we are talking about now, most of them lived in the ghettos, in the big cities, in Tehran, in Isfahan, in Hamadan, Mashhad, Shiraz, Yazd, and Tabriz, and smaller towns in the rural Iran. Now, when I'm saying that we are talking about communities rather than a community, we cannot talk about the experiences of the Jews in Isfahan to those of the Jews in Tehran, and of course not the one of the Jews of Mashhad compared to the Jews of Yazd. Many of them were uh, merchants, tax collectors, musicians, physicians, and dealt with uh, import and produ production of alcohol. They were uh, pushed to, deal, to have vocations that were forbidden for Muslims. 80% um, of the Jewish community at the time uh, were impoverished. And I want to start just by talking about the community, the Iraqi community. In the early 20th century, Iraq has a very large Jewish community. Actually, Baghdad was considered to be one of the most Jewish cities in the world. However, due to a series of uh, pogroms and other events in Iraqi history, many of the Iraqi Jews left Iran, Iraq. For example, in 1914, when the First World War erupted, uh, the Ottomans forced uh, conscription to the Ottoman army. 
Jews that didn't want to join the Ottoman army had to flee. Many of them came to Iran. The second wave started in 1941 after a series of pogroms that was known as the Farhud. They first moved to Basra and then from Basra in southern Iraq to Abadan. And then from Abadan, many of them moved to Tehran. Their impact on, the impact of the Iraqi Jewish community on Abadan was very significant. Um, for example, one of the first department stores in Iran was opened by the Alfi family, Iraqi Jewish family. And the square where the department store was still known as Meidane Alfi, Alfi Square. Fortunately, we have many surveys that show us the data, that give us data about the, the Jewish community in Iran. In 1940, 80% of the Jewish community were impoverished, underclass, and very peripheral to the Iranian society. And then in 1979, we look again, and we, and we see that 80% of the Jews belong to the middle class and urban elites. 10% were economic and industrial elite and only 10% belong to the lower classes. This is a huge social transformation, and we're talking only about 39 years. So what I want to do now is to see how we got from the situation in 1940 to the one in 1979. In 1941, um, the Second World War was happening already in Europe mostly. And in June 1941, Germany invaded uh, the Soviet Union, and so the Soviet Union joined the Allies in the war. Shortly after, in August 1941, Britain and, uh, and Russia invaded Iran under the pretext of uh, the support of Reza Shah to the uh, Nazi Germany. However, with their invasion, they started, they installed new social order. Reza Shah was not very democrat, and the censorship was harsh under his uh, rule, and political freedom was not in any question. And they overthrew him, sent him to exile, and then uh, coronated his son, Muhammad Reza. And this, was, this period came to be known as the liberal age in Iran. Many political organizations were formed, newspapers started to appear since there was not effective uh, censorship anymore. And also many relief organizations came to uh, support um, the, mostly the religious communities in Iran. Some of them were the JDC and the Red, Red Cross. Um, and also, as we are going to see soon, many, many refugees needed these organizations to get along. When I said that we don't tend to think about Iran as the safe havens, we have to understand the scale of events. In 1941, Iran opened its gates to 400,000 refugees. The population of Iran at that time was less than 15 million. And 400,000 refugees entered Iran in 1941, mostly from Poland, but there were some from Russia, uh, Central Asia, Iraq, there were Romanian, Hungarian, many other migrants and refugees. And actually, another role of uh, Iran in saving uh, Jews during the war um, appeared in a book that came out last year about the Iranian Schindler, an Iranian diplomat that saved 10,000 uh, Jews by giving them Iranian passports. 
Another famous uh, case of uh, saving Jews was the case of Yaldet Tehran. Jewish, Polish orphans that came to Iran, 700 of them, more than 700 of them, came to Iran before uh, moving forward to Palestine at that time. In 1941, another significant event took place, and this was the establishment of uh, the Jewish Charity Hospital in Tehran. In one of the corners of the Mahale, the Jewish ghetto, uh, Dr. Ruhala Sapir, a Jewish physician, opened its, his uh, hospital for a reason, um, due to unfortunate reason. He was an, a physician in one of the Tehran uh, government hospitals, and in 1939, he saw something that he couldn't live with. He saw a Jewish patient, pregnant patient, being mistreated for, and being insulted for being a Jew, and he decided to open a hospital, a hospital that will not be, um, will be open to, for, to everybody, will never discriminate, will give, will offer good treatment, and always free of charge. This will be proved very crucial in later years, but this is the entrance to the hospital. This picture was taken in 1979, after the revolution, and you can see the, the sign at the entrance with the biblical verse, written on the, on the sign, which means, those shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's written in uh, Hebrew and Farsi. This new era provided Jews new opportunities for vocations, professions, many of them because of knowing languages and being skilled writers like Moshfek Hamedani, Rahim Namvar, uh, Simon Farzani, Shmuel Anvar, became prominent journalists, many of them in, the, in Iran's largest newspapers. Musicians such as Musaha Neidavud, Murtazeha Neidavud, the Shirazi family, became very known Iranian musicians. Physicians like Ruhala Sapir and Habib Levi that was a dentist were famous in Iran at that time. And Actually, there's something, some anecdote about Jewish physician. Whenever I talk to a non-Jewish crowd and I'm telling the story of the Jewish community, I always get the comment of, when I was in Tehran and we needed a good doctor, we searched for a Jewish doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and they were gatekeepers of the Persian culture. The most famous dictionary of the Persian language was written by Suleiman Chaim, and it's still used to this day by the Ministry of Education in Iran and everywhere. Many, we can attribute large part of the success to the education system and education network that, oper that, was, that operated in Iran at the time. The Alliance schools, Otsara Torah, Alliance was a French-oriented school. Otsar Tara was orthodox, a religious uh, network of schools. Ort and Etefar from 1947. These schools provided good curriculum, very broad base of education, languages, skills, professional skills. For example, the Alliance graduates knew French, Arabic, Farsi, and English. At the Fax graduates, new English, and Arabic, and, um, and Hebrew. So they could, um, they could get more involved in Iranian society. They could get to new places with the education they got. And increasingly, they became more involved in their in the national matters outside their communities. They got involved in politics, like the Tude party, supporters of Mossadegh, nationalists. By the way, today is the 60th anniversary of the overthrow of, of, the overthrow of Mossadegh. 
Eventually, they climbed up the social ladder, got to key positions in many organizations and ministries, and they took advantage of the nation building of the Shah that was based on secular culture, Persian culture, and West-oriented, generally speaking. For example, this, this picture was taken four days before the coup, after the first failed attempt of the coup against Musadek, and we see the chief rabbi of Tehran, Chacham Yadid Yashofet, congratulating Musadek for uh, his temporary victory. In the 50s and, 60, and the 60s, we see the uh, Jews engaging with new vocations. The language skills allow them to open import-export businesses and be very good at it. Factories, industrialists, banking, even in the Ministry of Financing, some senior people were of the Jewish community. Healthcare, which means not only physicians, but also insurance providers, and education. The education was very significant uh, thing in the Iranian culture, in the Jewish culture in Iran. And actually, the JDC supported most of the education network of the Jews in Iran. So we see something very interesting here. The Jewish Iranians got good training and good education. It was provided by the Jewish philanthropies, the JDC, Alliance, and then they slowly became more affluent. They could afford themselves to send their kids to the Iranian elite institutions. So there was more vacancy in the Jewish institutions. And then these vacancies were taken by other Iranians that wanted to take advantage of the same facilities that helped the Jews climbing up the social ladder. So we know that, for example, by the mid-60s, at the Fox School was half not Jewish. And Aliyan schools in many places in, in Iran was, at some places, was predominantly not Jewish, and in some cases, half not Jewish. This is the Etefak school. It was an Iraqi establishment in Iran, but it, was, it belonged to the, Jewish, to the Iraqi Jewish community, but served all of the Iranians, all of the Tehranians. It was a very fancy building. It still is. This is the board at the entrance to the school, and there was a wedding uh, venue and bar mitzvah venues. And this is the school staff with the principal, Baruch Bruchim, in the 60s. Baruch Bruchim, for example, was a professor in Tehran University. And then he became the principal of Etefak School and brought it to great success. Under his tenure, in his tenure, uh, Etefak was the best school in Iran, according to the university entrance exam rate. So this was a major achievement. Now, I think that uh, I won't talk about Iran and Israel for a while, about better days between Iran and Israel. Iran was the first Muslim country to recognize Israel after the uh, establishment of Israel. They had some ups and downs in the 50s, but overall, they maintained good relationships. In 1962, the most devastating earthquake took place in Iran, and the center of it was in Qazvin. Israel was the first to send support and crews to help them, and also got some ideas of rebuilding Qazvin. It was actually rebuilt according to some building models of kibbutz, and many Israeli companies took part in the uh, rebuilding of Kazvin. This left 
a very significant impact and impression on the Iranian uh, memory. Two years later, maybe the most prominent Iranian intellectual, Jalal al-Ahmad, and his wife, the famous author, Simin Daneshvar, were invited to Israel. Came to Israel as official guest of the ministry, uh, of the prime minister, and they were uh, visiting for 10 days. They stayed in a guest house in the kibbutz Ayel Tashachar. Now, Jalal al-Ahmad was the beacon of the Iranian left, and he still is to some extent. And this is why it was very, very surprising to see his report upon his return to Iran. This is what he wrote in the kibbutz uh, guest book. Regardless of the hospitality, I saw here people I have never expected to meet, learned people, understanding and open-minded. In a sense, they are implementing plateau. Honestly speaking, I always identified Israel with the kibbutz, and now I understand why. His wife, Simin Daneshvar, wrote, as I see it, the kibbutz is the answer to the problems of all the countries, including our own. This was written in 1964. Uh, Jalal Ahmad published his uh, travelogue in, an, in a large newspaper in Israel, in uh, Iran. And a few years later, when he was just about to publish his travelogue as a book, the 1967 war happened, and it quite changed his opinion. But uh, overall, um, this book was very, very important in shaping the public image of um, Israel in Iran. In the 1960s and 70s, we had large, thriving Israeli community in Iran. Many of Israeli companies, contractors, came to Iran, worked there, and we know the numbers are around 5,000, there is a good documentary that recently came out about the Israeli community in Iran, and I dearly recommend watching it. The Israelis were involved in industrial relations, military, political collaboration, and some of the collaboration was brighter and some was darker, but um, overall there was the relations were maintained in good terms. In the 1970s, right before the revolution, the Iranian Jewish community constituted 0.3% of the population. There were around 85,000 Jews in Iran before the revolution. And now these are the achievements that they got. Two out of 18 members of the Royal Academy of Sciences were Jews. 80 out of 4,000 university senior lecturers, 2%. And 600 out of 10,000 physicians uh, were Jews. These were large numbers for a small community. And then the 1979 revolution happened. One of the most heroic stories of the Jewish community during the revolution was happening in the Sapir Hospital. Sapir Hospital had a very important role in the scheme of events of the revolution. As you all know, in 1978, middle of 1978 until early 1979, millions of Iranians took to the streets. Many of them faced military and police brutality. They were shot in the streets, and if they were wounded and got taken to the hospitals in Iran, they would probably be turned into the hand of the Savak, the military, the secret service of the Shah. 
There was one hospital in Iran that didn't turn in uh, protesters, and this was the Sapir Hospital. Many Iranians, that many Iranian revolutionaries owe their life to the good crew of Sapir Hospital for maintaining Dr. Sapir's legacy of They never turned in no one to the hands of the Savak and they were acknowledged for that later when Dr. Sapir was announced to be a martyr of the revolution. And there was also another group, which is the Intellectual Society of the Jewish Iranians, also very important group that uh, tried to protect the community in, in periods of instability. And they actually had a significant role in um, drafting the new constitution of after the revolution. Mm. And that's it. <laughs> so, um, we want to thank Lior, but we want to do this. Um, likewise, at the same time with questions. So, Linda, do you have those cards? If you pass the cards to the right. Oh. Okay. Okay, so uh, one of the questions was, please discuss the level of religious observance uh, where Iranian Jews assimilated and were not observant. So the two levels. This is a very good question. The Iranian, the religious, it's hard to measure religious, religiosity of a community. There were many um, different traditions of, of Iranian religiosity. And so we know, for example, that in Tehran there were many synagogues, and some of them didn't have a mechitza between uh, men and women. Were they less religious? No, but this was the local tradition. Other synagogues were more uh, inspired by uh, other uh, communities. For example, the Iraqi community had their synagogue in the Etefak compound, and they maintained the tradition of the Iraqi community. And then we can talk about the Mashadi tradition that was totally different than the Tehrani or the Isfahani since they had un different circumstances on which they had to operate. And what was the second part of the, of the question? <laughs> Did I answer the question? <laughs> All right. Ah. 
Ah, simulation. So, religion is not a good place to check the assimilation of the community because assimilation in the Muslim community, in the Muslim society, cannot be, cannot be seen through uh, Jewish religiosity. However, the Iranian community was very, the Iranian Jewish community was very assimilated into the Iranian general society. And um, we, I think I showed it through their uh, participation in the national organizations and being part of the Iranian prominent culture. Um, for example, Jews were part of the entertainment society, not only the musicians, but also filmmakers and film production and talk shows on Iranian TV. Um, so they were assimilated to a very large extent. So another question you raised actually earlier when you said um, you'd be surprised how many you'd be surprised at what's the largest population in the Middle East, ex-Israel, um, of Jews. And you mentioned these 30 or 35,000. So there was a question apropos that. What's the current status of the Jewish community in Iran? Um, as far as their safety, how are they functioning? Are they working? Or do they feel secure? So the Jews in Iran today enjoy a status of recognized minority. There are three religious minorities that are recognized by the Iranian constitution, and these are the Jews, the Christians, and the Zoroastrians. They enjoy freedom of religion. That is not to say that they have good life. This is just to say that they are not worse off the regular Iranians. <laughs> I mean, they can, they can travel freely, and some of them travel to Israel and come back. And they can work in whatever they want to do. They have. Uh, restaurants in Tehran, most of them are in, Iran, in Tehran. They have restaurants, they have businesses, they have clubs, they have their schools, and 20 synagogues are still active in Tehran today. So I think that, you know, the life in, in Iran is not something easy. But the Jews don't suffer from systematic persecution or anti Semitism. And for example, the president before Ahmadinejad, Khatami, visited uh, three times during his tenure the, the synagogues of Tehran. There is a Jewish per, uh, representative in the parliament, and so they are being represented. They have their uh, newspapers. They, they are pretty, they enjoy life as much as they can in the circumstances of the Islamic Republic. Uh, could you name, you mentioned a number of uh, uh, Jewish intellectuals. Yeah. And then we spoke about the uh, writing of the Constitution. Yeah. Do you, um, do you know the names of some of those? Yeah. So one of the most prominent Jewish intellectuals in Iran in the 70s was Aziz Daneshrad. Um, he was active in the political sphere since the 40s, and he was one of the Jews that represented the minorities in the Constitutional uh, Assembly, um, representing actually not only the Jews, but the minorities. And there, was, there were two other Jewish lawyers that were not part of the Assembly, but consulted to the Assembly. You know, there's a there's many well-known, I have my prompter, okay. Uh, um, somebody asked me a question about the Alganian family. So um, they're pretty well-known in the United States, of course. So are their descendants still there? Is, are the family still in? Well, uh, the head of the Jewish community for a long time was Habib El-Kanyan. Uh, 
was a very generous man, very successful industrialist. I don't know about the family if they're still in, if they still have descendants in Iran, but uh, the story of of him was very. In, to some extent, it shows the level of assimilation of the Jewish community because he was an important figure in the Iranian public life and the Jewish community, of course. But he also shows the tragedy of what happened with the, between the Jewish community and the revolutionaries right after the revolution as he was executed right after the revolution um, for supposedly uh, spying for Israel. And he was the most prominent Jew that was executed. How would you characterize the difference between the Jews of Tehran and Isfahan? <laughs> First of all, the accent. <laughs> they have a doorbell accent. Besides. <laughs> um, I think that the life in Isfahan was much calmer. Tehran was the political center of, of uh, the Jews and of, of Iran, of course. And so it was much crowded, much more uh, charged with political aspiration and political tensions and religious tensions. Isfahan was known, the first name of Isfahan is Yaudia is the city of the Jews. And it is told that the first Jews that came to Isfahan brought with them land from Israel and made Isfahan the, the, the new land of Israel. So the, the Isfahani community uh, was known to be the indigenous Iranian, the indigenous Persian community. So they, they enjoyed much calmer life usually. Somebody asked a question about, um, I think you answered in, in many ways, but I'd like you to delve in a little more. When did anti-Semitism um, arise in Iran to the extent that it did, and what do you think the causes were? This is a very difficult question, because... Easy, I don't have to answer. <laughs> um, it's hard to define anti-Semitism in that context. As I said, there was not systematic persecution of Jews in Iran. There were some events, especially in the 19th century, um, but other than that, there were events of persecution, events of tension between Muslims and Jews. So, and we cannot talk about anti-Semitism in the sense of the European anti-Semitism. The way that we know that there was literature of anti-Semitism, there was a tradition of anti-Semitism. This was not the case of Iran, usually. Um, in the 19th century, there were a few events of the, uh, in Mashhad, for example, that Jews were forced to convert to Islam. There were events in uh, Barafurushi. There were events, local events in Yazd. But overall, especially after the Constitutional Revolution and the implementation of a civil discourse, this was not the case. There were some events. For example, after, in 1968, the Israeli soccer team played Iran in Tehran. And it was right after the 67 war. And as I mentioned in my lecture, this was about the time that the perception, the public perception of Israel was changed. And Israel scored first in the, in the game. And the story goes that they lost, eventually they lost 2-1 just to be able to leave the field alive. <laughs> So, I mean, this was a very traumatic event in the modern history of Iran, but this was a single event. And it wasn't out of, it was out of political tension with Israel, not versus the Iranian Jewish community. 
It wasn't against the Iranian Jewish community, but rather against Israel. Can you uh, speak a little about the uh, Mashai Jews? Um, I guess you mean the 19th century, the event of... Yeah. yeah. Somebody's question, so... Yeah. So, in 1834, um, there were a series of events in Mashhad that forced uh, the Jewish community to convert altogether to Islam. Many, many of the Iranian Jews converted or had Muslim li ran Muslim lives towards the surrounding but maintained their Jewish identity inside. Um, they were known as the Anusim of Mashhad. Um, for example, we know that uh, when they had their weddings, the ketubah had two sides. One was written in Farsi and it was very much like the Muslim uh, marriage contract. And the inside was in Hebrew, uh, the regular version of the ketubah. Um, they maintained this double identity until the mid 20th century, not out of uh, necessity, but rather out of an habit already. So it, it, they have a very interesting story. Um, I recommend there was a book that was published a few years ago by Daniel Tzadik, historian of Yeshiva University, that described the, um, the life of the Jews in the 19th century Iran, and he goes in details. In, the story. So I'll give you one other one. Um, what were your sources, other than the JDC archive, somebody asked, and have you ever been to Iran? Um, have you done any research there? All right, so as an Israeli and carrier of an Israeli passport, <laughs> I'm not really allowed uh, to go to Iran. So I had to, um, to get other sources. One of them was uh, memoirs. Jewish Iranians love to write. And they wrote many memoirs. And the memoirs tell us a large part of the story. Jewish press. The Jews had newspapers, community newspapers, in Tehran, in Yazd. There were bulletins of the Alliance schools, ORT, uh, at Efak. The there were uh, Iranian Jewish writers that wrote books, not necessarily about their life as Jews, but we can understand the environment of their life better. Um, other than that, um, government documents, both from Iran that were published in edited volumes of documents and correspondence with uh, the British uh, government, for example. I went to the British archives and they have enormous amount of uh, documents corresponding with the Iranian regime and uh, heads of communities in Iran and so Largely, these are my sources. Well, thank you. I want to thank you and thank you. and Lior. We, we're going to finish in, a, in just a few minutes. Lior will will be around for a little while after. If any of you have questions, it was difficult for me to go through this as it came up. I try to avoid duplications. I'm sure some of your questions weren't answered, probably because I didn't bring it up here and I'm watching, I'm very mindful of the time. But Lior will be around after one-on-one -on -one questions. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you sit down? No, not yet, not yet. So I want to introduce, to summarize and close, uh, Linda Levy, and Linda Levy is the professional director of JDC Archives. Um, I'm a volunteer, but Linda really runs the show. So 
She has some closing remarks, and then we'll break. Thanks. Okay. I just want to thank you all for joining us for this program today. I'd like to extend special thanks to Mike Nassimi and Lynn Winters of the American Sephardi Federation for co-sponsoring the program. I'd like to draw your attention to some of the materials on the tables outside um, uh, with information about the JDC Archives Names Index and our website. Um, please sign up for the JDC Archives e-newsletter and keep in touch with us um, on Facebook. Our website is archives.jdc.org. Thank you. Thank you.